there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing. a place where sin and shame are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Good morning, and a warm welcome to everybody to our services today at the Real Tree Church. And for all of you listening online, welcome. We have a few announcements. Uh, first one up is uh, Dave and Sherry are not here today because Sherry had an accident. Please check with Pastor Sean on details. Uh, but our hearts go out to them. And Keep them in your prayers. Yeah, yeah, she's okay. She just had a rolled her car over and had a, something with her shoulder. Probably had some surgery, so it's not life threatening. Yeah. And then, uh, why we pray Bible study is going to start up now, uh, led by Pastor Kevin and Pastor David, and it's going to go May, June, July, and August. 
So it sounds very, very exciting. It would be fun to sign up and be part of that. Uh, Women's Fellowship and Craft Project Day, Saturday, May 19th from 9 to 12 uh, in the morning. Please see Kaylin or Kate. VBS postcard invites uh, for kids 4 to 10. Uh, please note that will be in June 18th to the 22nd. It would be wonderful to see kids signed up for that. Uh, and we have adopted the road in front of the church from the S-curve down to 86. There's a sign-up sheet. Please check with Pastor Sean on that. Uh, also, uh, Jim Schweitzer he is Von Hansen's in Apple Valley uh, next Saturday and Sunday for fundraiser for his outreach. And again, if you are a visitor, please tear off the little flap on the side, put it in the offering basket. We'd love to know more about you. Um, our psalm today is Psalm 96, and we will be reading from the ESV. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. For he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. That ends our reading. Let's stand and worship our great God through song. Praises to the one who saves us. Through his blood he gave us life and now we come. Everyone. Praises to the one who saves us, through his blood he gave us life and now we come, everyone.
Heavenly Father, how great you are. Lord, we praise you on this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place. God, we ask that you forgive us of our sins as we confess them before you. Lord, sins that we commit and, and sins that we, when we don't do things we're supposed to do. God, forgive us, grant us repentance, increase our faith, help us to love you more, uh, help us to love others more than we do ourselves. God, as we continue to worship you through the preaching of the word, I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of those who are here, of those who are listening online to hear what you have to say to us today through your word. Lord, we praise you and give you the glory in all things and pray that above all your will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a second and greet somebody. Say hi to your neighbor. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome again to the Real Tree Church. I'm glad the Lord has brought you here today to hear from His Word. Uh, before we get started, just another note on David and Sherry. Um, Sherry completely destroyed the car. I asked David if that was the first thing he asked her, and he said no. So that's good, I guess. Uh, she, she cut her ear, which means she probably banged her head. She broke some ribs. Her left shoulder was dislocated, and there's something, I can't remember if, it, if there's something cracked or broken in there where she might require surgery. But all of those things are not life-threatening, so we just need to pray that for healing for her and her to be able to tolerate David as he hovers around her. <laughs> so they'll be fine. I'm, as I get more details, I will relate them to everyone as they ask. Right now she's down in Rochester at a hospital down there. I'm not even sure. I think it's maybe St. Mary's or something like that. But um, according to whether or not surgery is done, we'll, we'll tell when she comes home or not. So as I hear more, I will keep you all informed. Just keep them in your prayers, okay? Well, this Lord's Day, we'll be continuing our on with our study of Matthew's Gospel. So I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and, and turn over with me again to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. This morning we'll be looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares, and we're going to look at its explanation. 
So that will cover verses 24 through 30, and then verses 36 through 43. We will come back next week and pick up the two shorter parables in verses 31 through 35. Last week, if you recall, we came across another text that is hard for us to hear. It just doesn't seem fair to us to think that Jesus allowed some to understand and not others. I know this is difficult, but we have to be true to what the text says. We cannot read our own biases into the text. We cannot make the text say what we want it to say. Neither can we make God be what we think he should be. That's called idolatry. Scripture says that God in his infinite mercy and grace chose to save some when he was obliged, mind you, to save none. You see, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. All. Not some, but all. There is no one who does good, no, not one, and no one seeks after God. But in spite of that absolute fact, God in his mercy and grace chose to send the Lord Jesus Christ to live a perfect life, the life that we could not and cannot live in order to die in our place. God made a way to redeem the elect. And what we need to do is rejoice and praise God that he provided a way for men to be saved. Rather than getting upset over not all being saved or getting all twisted up over God reserving his sovereign right to do with his creation what he pleases, why not praise him for his mercy and grace? Because as soon as you begin to think that you know better than God and read into the text what you think it should read, you're stepping on God's toes, so to speak. It's a dangerous place to be. You are placing your mercy and grace and understanding above the sovereign God of the universe. Just let that sink in for a moment. See, it's none of my business or your business concerning who is or who is not saved. We don't know who who is of the elect and who is not, and frankly, it doesn't matter because our job remains the same. We are to worship and glorify God, and we are to share the gospel. That's our job. We're to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, and we are to preach the gospel to all the world. That's our job. All the rest of it is God's job. How about we do our job, and we let God do His job? And all of that, we've got to have a high view of God. And part of having a high view of God is to understand that He knows things that we do not. His ways are not our ways. I assure you there will not be a single person in hell who did not reject the Lord Jesus Christ. There won't be one person there who didn't reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's just worry about our job of worshiping God and being obedient to the Great Commission and let God worry about doing His job. Amen? So after explaining to the disciples why he he had begun to speak in parables, our Lord goes right back to telling the crowd more parables. And keep in mind, that these parables are examples of what it's like in the kingdom of God between the first coming of Christ and the second coming. In other words, our Lord is telling us what it's like to live in the church age. He's telling us what it's like to be in the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of heaven right now in the church age. So let's go now to our text. We'll read the parable of the wheat and tares and then the explanation. I invite you to stand with me in reverence for the reading of the word of the living God. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now the explanation in 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, 
The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all, and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of the living God. Father, we praise you this morning as we come into your throne room, as we look at this text before us this morning. God, help us to rightly understand what you have for us here. God, help us to take a look in our own hearts and see, are we weeds? Are we wheat? Lord, help us to examine our own lives. Look deeply into our own lives. Help us to understand what it is that you're doing now in this church age and how we can be a part of it. And God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would grant us repentance and increase our faith, that we would love you more each day and love others more than ourselves. We pray that your will would be done in all this and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. If you are a follower of Christ today, you surely notice that things are not all that swell. As a matter of fact, the world seems to be coming apart at the seams. Just a, just a preliminary glance at the propagandists that claim to be hard news will tell you that all is not as it should be. If you have a Christian worldview, that is. It seems that Secularism, which is in fact a religion, make no mistake, secularism is a religion. It seems as if it, if secularism is ruling the day. The fairy tale of evolution is being taught to children in public schools because of a belief rooted in evolution, which necessarily puts no value whatsoever on human life. Babies are being murdered in the womb by the thousands, and our children are murdering each other in their schools. Something as simple and scientifically factual as determining whether or not one is male or female is suddenly up for debate because man in all of his wisdom is smarter than the Creator. The sin of homosexuality is glorified in every area of society, and the leaders of this country at every level are by and large professional liars with no concern for anything but their own promotion and enrichment. It is in fact growing so hostile towards Christianity here in the good old USA that but I recently saw an article that California is trying to ban the sale of the Bible. Think of that. That is something that's done in communist countries. Communist countries, you have to sneak Bibles into. At first glance, it may appear that God is losing the battle. It may seem as if all is lost. But I want to assure you that is not the case. That is not the case. I want you to take heart and understand that God is in complete control of all things. And I know who wins in the end because I read the end of the book. Y'all should too. In our text before us this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us by way of a parable why these things appear as they do in our world today. So let's see what he has to say. Let's go back to our text and take a look at verses 24 and 25 together. Our Lord says he put another, Matthew says he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So our Lord finishes up explaining this parable of the sower and why he's teaching in parables. And then he continues right on with more parables. The kingdom of heaven. It's both here and not yet. So we have to keep in mind what our Lord is referring to when he uses the term kingdom of heaven. And by the way, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is here right now. And that process has begun. Men and women are being saved and they're being entered, ushered into the kingdom of heaven. God rules and reigns through his people. 
He is ultimately in control of everything, but he and his wisdom has allowed Satan to rule this world to the extent that, that God allows it. And the kingdom of heaven is not yet, and that one day the king will return here physically. The Lord Jesus Christ will return here physically, and Satan will be thrown into hell for all eternity. And when that happens, the kingdom will be here physically and permanently. So what our Lord is addressing here is what's going on here before the king arrives to set up his permanent kingdom. And this time in history, this era, is like a man who sowed good seed in a field, but while he slept, his enemy came and sowed weed seed among the good seed in the man's field. This makes no sense to us here in the 21st century, but this is something that actually happened in the first century, in first century Palestine. If you were a farmer and you ticked off your neighbor and got cross with him, that your neighbor may come in and, and take revenge on you by sowing weeds in your field during the night. He would try to wreck your crop. He would sneak in there at night a, a, after you had just sown it with the good seed and he would sow weed in your freshly planted field and he would try to destroy your livelihood. If you can't eat, if you can't pay your bills, you'd be in a bad way. And in fact, it was so prominent that the Romans passed laws that forbid it and they punished those who were caught to deter the practice. And I tell you that so you will see that when Jesus said this to his disciples, they knew immediately what he was talking about. They knew. Now verse 26, he continues, So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. Obviously, the farmer would not have been able to tell what had happened until after the weeds came up. Right? Everything would need to come up. The crops come up and the weeds do too. Now verse 27, And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? So the servants, who would have been the ones in charge of, of tending the field, they notice that something's not right. They can tell that there is more than just the crop growing in their master's field. So they, they come and tell him about it. Look at his response in verse 28. He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? In other words, do you want us to go yank them up, pull them up? The master recognizes what has happened straight away. He knows for sure that he sowed good seed. So he knows that then the, his enemy had to come in and sow bad seed, and his enemy would then be responsible for the weeds. And notice that the servants offer to get rid of the weeds here at the end of this verse. They just want to go into the field and start ripping up what they think are the weeds. But look how our Lord answers them in verses 29 and 30. But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds... You root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Have you ever had weeds growing in your garden or your flower bed? And, and when you tried to pull them up, uh, the roots of the weeds are so entangled with the roots of the vegetables or the flowers that the good plant is ripped up with the bad. Everyone's done that who's had any kind of garden. When I was a kid, my grandpa farmed a couple thousand acres, and, and one of my first jobs was to walk the soybeans to get rid of volunteer corn and Johnson grass. And in my early years, I used a, I was given a machete, a not so very sharp one, or a weed hook, and told to walk these hundreds of acres and, and get rid of the volunteer corn and Johnson grass. But when I got up into high school and technology advanced, I got to use a weed wick. And this was a, a PVC tube filled with Roundup, and it had a wick on the end, and that you just touched the weed with the Roundup, and it would die. But I was not to pull up the weeds. Don't pull up the weeds. To pull up the weeds would wreck the beans many times, and I didn't mind that because it was a lot more work to pull them up than to just touch them with the Roundup and kill them. But that's the picture our Lord is painting here. He doesn't want him to pull up the weeds. To pull up the weeds at this point may wreck the crop. But if the servants wait until the harvest, it doesn't matter. Because both will be taken out together. The crop will be mature. It'll be time to harvest it. The wheat and the weeds will be separated, and the wheat will be put in the barn, and the weeds will be burned up. So can you see the picture that our Lord is painting here for these fellows? A man sows his field with good wheat seed. An en enemy comes in after the field is sown at night and sows weed among the good seed. The servants notice the weed and offer to pull them, but the master tells them to wait until the harvest 
or both the weeds and the crops will be taken out together, and then they can be rightly separated, storing the wheat in the barn and burning the weeds. The wheat and weeds can be rightly separated because the fruit at that point will be obvious. There'll be no mistaking weeds for wheat at that point. Now, if you have that picture in your mind, skip down to verse 36 in your Bibles. We'll come back and tackle those in between next week. Verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. So our Lord finishes his teaching by way of parable. And he goes into a nearby home. And apparently the disciples understand the two shorter parables that we'll look at next week, and they skip right to the parable of the wheat and the tares, and they ask our Lord to explain it to them. They want to know what he's talking about. Verse 37, he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Our Lord uses his favorite title for himself here in this verse. Son of Man. That title, Son of Man, focuses on our Lord's humility and on his humanity. He is the second Adam. It identifies him as being fully human, and it also is a well-known title for the Messiah that Daniel used. In other words, the disciples would have known what he was talking about. Jesus used it of himself many times, and it's only used two other times in all the New Testament to, re to refer to Jesus by someone other than himself. Paul uses it once in Acts 7, and the Apostle John uses it once in Revelation 14. All the other times you see it in the New Testament as Christ referring to himself. So the sower is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the farmer in the parable. Now verse 38. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Our Lord continues with his explanation. The field is the world as in this rock that you and I are living on and all that are in it, the world. There is some disagreement as to what our Lord is referring to here when he uses the word world. I'm not sure why. I don't understand why. But some think that our Lord is referring to the visible church when he says world. And by visible church, I mean all the people in the world that claim they are Christians. I can see how this could apply in that context if you agree that everyone who calls himself a Christian is actually a part of the church. I, however, believe that the church is not a building or even those who claim they are Christians. I believe there is only one church, and that is made up of the elect who have repented and put their faith in Christ and are actively living out their faith. Anything less than that cannot be considered the church. But even more convincing than that, if you look at the Greek, the word... Matthew uses here is cosmos, which means world, translated as world. If he were referring to the church, he would have used ecclesia, which is the word for church. So he didn't say church, he said world. I believe that our Lord is speaking of the whole world. Now, in that, it is also probable and evident, I would say, that this spills over into the people who claim to be the church, seeing as how we can't tell for certain who's truly redeemed and who is not. So in that sense, it can spill over there. So back to the verse. The good seed are believers, which refers to the elect who are genuinely and permanently redeemed, those blood-bought saints who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the weeds are all others. Everyone who does not belong to the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to Satan. There is no neutral ground. You are either with the Lord or you are against him. You are either wheat or you are a tare and a weed. There is no middle ground. Now, this goes beyond the scope of this parable, but it needs to be noted that tares can and do become wheat. Okay? Everyone begins as a tare and by the grace and mercy of God is miraculously converted into a wheat. That's beyond the scope of the parable, and that's not what our Lord is addressing here, but we need to note that that is a fact, and it is true. So, we have the Lord as the sower, we have the world as the field, believers as good seed, non-believers as bad seed. Now verse 39. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. 
the bad guy, the disgruntled farmer, the enemy, who sowed the weeds among the good seed is none other than Satan himself, is what our Lord is saying here. He is the one responsible for and causing all the mayhem in the field of the world. He's the one. Make no mistake, Satan is a very real being. He is not a not some cute cartoon character with a cute little pitchfork. The Bible tells us, in fact, that he's out there roaming around like a lion seeking to devour those whom he can destroy. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy this church. You are not stronger than him. You do not know your Bibles better than he does. You cannot bind him or cast him out. And you certainly cannot outsmart him. However, you need not fear him if you belong to the Lord, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In other words, the Holy Spirit is vastly more powerful than Satan. No competition. The Holy Spirit's God. Satan is a created being. But neither are we to underestimate him. He is doing all that he can to wreck whatever God is doing in the world. That's who the evil one is. The harvest is, of course, the end of the age. It is that time when the Lord returns to set up his kingdom here on earth. It is the time when life as we know it will come to an end, will be no more as we know it. I am very much looking forward to this time. And of course, the reapers or the harvesters are the angels. The Lord will assign angels the very important job of sorting the wheat and the tares. Let's continue. Take a look at verses 42-42 together. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and law, all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. At the end of the age, when the Lord comes back, all things will be sorted out. No one's going to get away with anything. No one's going to get away with their sins. All will give an account. The Son of Man, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to send His angels to, to sort out the good from the bad, the redeemed from the unredeemed, the wheat from the weeds. And the weeds, the unredeemed, those who have rejected Christ, will be thrown into hell for all eternity. And that place will be an awful place. It'll be an awful place. It is somewhere, I assure you, you do not want to go. Hell is pictured throughout Scripture as being a lake of fire. A lake of fire and brimstone. It's a place of eternal torment. It's a place where they'll be weeping and wailing. The torment will be so horrific that those who are condemned there will be continually grinding and gnashing their teeth constant pain and torment. I want you to understand that this is a very real place where very real people will be consigned for all eternity. Very real people. I want you to see what Dr. MacArthur notes. He says, Hell will not be a place that some jokingly envision where the ungodly will continue to do their thing while the godly do theirs in heaven. Hell will have no friendship, no fellowship, no camaraderie, no comfort. It will not even have the debauched pleasures in which the ungodly love to revel in on earth. There will be no pleasure in hell of any kind or degree, only torment, day and night, forever and ever. That's what it says in Revelation. This is a very serious topic. As sure as the sun rises, hell is a real place. And another thing, Satan is not the ruler of hell. Satan is not the one in charge in hell. Satan will eventually be imprisoned there with the rest of those who reject Christ. Make no mistake, it is God who is the ruler of hell. It is he that created it. It is he that maintains it. And it is he who will condemn those who, who reject him. God is the ruler of hell. Satan is real and so is hell. 
So please don't buy into this modern notion that neither of them exist. They're real. And finally, verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Just as the wicked will be condemned to hell, the righteous will be ushered into paradise. Those whom have those who have repented and trusted in Christ and have persevered in the faith will be forever with the Savior. All sin and disease and sorrow will be gone forever. Forever. We will be with our Lord forevermore. So just as awful as hell is, ten times more wonderful is heaven. Paradise with our Lord. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be. We can't imagine. I think if we had any idea how wonderful it would, it was going to be in heaven, we'd probably be out standing in the road hoping to get run over by a truck. We have no idea. We can't imagine how wonderful heaven is, and, 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 but we need to try to imagine how horrific hell is and to be there forever with no break, no reason. As our Lord says here at the end of this verse, he who has ears, let him hear. Listen to what God is saying. Listen. Pay attention. That's what he means when he says that. Pay attention. What are we to take away from our text this morning? Well, first I want you, I want us to use this text to understand what's going on in the world right now. And to not lose hope. And to know what we're to do. The world seems like it's spiraling out of control because God in his sovereign wisdom is allowing Satan to sow weeds. He's allowing it. There are people who are unredeemed and want nothing to do with the Lord and are, in fact, completely against the Lord. And those people are going to continue to create havoc and mayhem in the world. But fear not, because God is ultimately in control of all of it. God's got it under control, and nothing is happening outside of His control. All of those people who are doing those things, they're going to give an account for their actions. They're going to give an account. They're going to give an account. You need to find great hope in God's sovereign control. Trust in God to take care of you and your family in the midst of all of this as he sees fit. Trust God. But in all of this havoc and mayhem, we're not to sit idly by. We are to be about the Lord's business. We're to be about the Lord's business. In this parable, we see that we're not supposed to be about removing the weeds, though, okay? It's not our job to remove the weeds. It's not our job to decide who is a believer and who is not and then try to forcibly remove or convert those whom we think belong to Satan. That is something that is up to God, not us. He's the one who works all of that out. We tend to see things like pretty much the entire leftist agenda which is holy and completely against God and we think we need to try to remove it we would, we would like to do away with it by force if we could we see the rampant sin in the world the unbelievable wickedness and we want it gone and rightly so it's against God and we have and we're right in having a righteous anger and hatred towards the wickedness however our means are not ones of violence our means are not ones of violence. In the past, well-meaning Christians have tried to force the faith through violence, and it never ended well. There's a guy named Charlemagne, and he was the Holy Roman Emperor in the ninth century. And he conquered large portions of Europe, bringing Christianity with him as he went. And when he, when he conquered an army, he would take them down to the river and tell them they can either, either enter the water for baptism or drowning. Take their pick, but they're going in the water. They could either convert to Christianity or die. You can imagine that there were large numbers of, quote, converts, can't you? 
However, they were largely, if not entirely, false converts. Because that is not the way of the Lord. That is not the way the kingdom of heaven advances. We win people through persuasion, not force. Through love, not violence. We are not God's instruments of judgment and destruction, but rather we are His instruments of truth and grace. We are to have compassion towards unbelievers, not condemnation. We are not to be like the Westboro Baptist Church that I'm sure you all have seen on the news in the past. That is not a church. That's not a church. Those people do not understand what God wants from His people. The church is to teach and preach the truth of God. We are to stand on the truth of the Word of God and never waver and never back off. We're to preach against sin and all unrighteousness. But our purpose is not to condemn, but to convert a difference. Our purpose is not to be the judge, but to be the means of winning souls. That's why we're here. Our purpose is not to punish, but to convert the weak to weep. We want to make the sons of the devil into the sons of the kingdom of God. And we do that by sharing the gospel with one person at a time and discipling them and teaching them to obey the Lord. That's our job. That's our job. And finally, it's always a good idea to examine your own heart. Are you weak or are you a tear? A tear is another name for weed. Are you weak or are you weeds? Have you repented of your sins and trusted in Christ and His work for salvation or are you still doing your own thing? I urge you to examine your heart today. If you are in doubt, then repent this day. Forsake your sins and trust in Christ and Him alone. He'll save you. You're not good and you can't be good enough to enter into the kingdom of God, but Jesus is and was. He did what we couldn't. Trust in Him and His righteousness. And forsake any notion of your own. Being good enough. You're able to save yourself. Repent and believe today and you will be saved. Today is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are forever grateful for your mercy and your long-suffering and the grace that you show us day in and day out that as we continually and perpetually fall short, you show us mercy. You extend us grace. You offer us a way to be redeemed, to trust in Christ, to not be condemned to hell for all eternity. Lord, I pray that you would open hearts and minds here today or listening online and, and usher those people in. Draw those who are far from you to you. Who plead for the lost. Father, we also help us to know what our job is. God, that our job is not to condemn, not to judge but rather to share the gospel, to love people into your kingdom. To stand faithfully on your word and never waver. Never bend in what we know is true. But at the same time, reach out to others and love them into your kingdom. God, give us the courage to do that. Give us the courage and the determination to obey you, to obey the, the great commandment, the great commission. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. As we continue to uh, worship through the taking of the offering, Lord, we pray, pray that you would bless that and help us to have the wisdom to use it to expand your kingdom and to glorify you. Lord, we love you and praise you. We pray that your will be done in our lives, individually and corporately as a church. And through Jesus we pray. Amen. Ushers, would you come forward, please? Take the offering.
God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Oh, the wonder, oh, the wonder.